Ayan. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good day. I hope you're doing well. Give me a thumbs up, a shake, handshake, something. Let me know that you're doing okay out there in Zoom land. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Eureka Huggins. I'm the director for the Payne Fellowship Program here at Howard University and my colleague, Melina Perez, the manager for Congressional Outreach and uh, Selections. We're happy to have you join us today. We're very, very excited um, for this is the last session for Backstop Week. We're so honored to have our colleagues from USAID join us. Um, this is an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about the career pathways that uh, for the USAID Foreign Service. The Payne Fellowship is, um, is a graduate fellowship program that is a unique pathway to the USAID Foreign Service. Our Foreign Service officers at USAID, they work on the front lines of some of the most pressing global issues, uh, crisis stabilization and governance, humanitarian assistance, you're gonna hear them tonight, education, health, the environment, um, economic development, uh, and so much more. And I know you have been able to at least read up a lot more about it on the Payne Fellowship website, as well as on the USAID website. So tonight, we are going to have our colleagues tell you exactly what they do, how they do it, what they are passionate about. And hopefully, this is going to drive you to really push forward your application and to join them at some point as a, a future colleague uh, in one of these backstops. So again, thank you for joining us. So we are honored to have our colleagues from USAID. We thank them because they have taken time off from their very busy schedule. They are not just here in DC, they're across the globe. Uh, they are joining us because they also see that this is a great opportunity to share the important work that they're doing. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have Tally Lind. Tally is um, a senior with the Democracy for, um, Bureau for Democracy and Human Rights Governance. She's a DEIA advisor and the Acting Backstop Coordinator. We also have Don Ch uh, Chisholm, who is the Director for Conflict and Violence Prevention Center at USAID. And then of course, Kevin Brown, who is the Deputy Office Director, the Office of Technical Programs, the Bureau of Human Humanitarian Assistance, Katrina Mahoney, a Payne Fellow, a 2020 Payne Fellow. We're so happy to have you. Katrina, welcome home, <laughs> or back home, I should say, right? Katrina Mahoney, um, a Humanitarian Assistance Foreign Service Officer. Uh, Brett Brackart, who is a Humanitarian Foreign Service Officer at, at USAID in El Salvador. And uh, of course, Zach Guerrero, who is also a former Payne Fellow and alum and a Foreign Service Officer for USAID. And in the background, must make sure I call him out, uh, Mike DeCity, who is the director for the Office of Global Partnerships, the Bureau of Human Humanitarian Assistance, and our colleague, Tahelia um, Barrett, who is also uh, with USAID's Foreign Service Officer. So welcome, welcome colleagues, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Tally. Should I turn it over to you and Don? Yes. yes, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, and I am going to, I'm, I'm now on my own slide, so I'm going to assume that you've started off on our first slide. If you could pull that up. Is that, is that up for all, for everyone? Uh, pull it, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay, great. So we'll, um, you'll, you'll notice as, as Melina is, is pulling up these slides that, um, the title is Backstop 76. Uh, crisis stabilization and governance. So um, as you, you know, peruse the idea of working in at USAID as a foreign service officer, um, you'll see that we refer to our specialties as a backstop. At the State Department, they call them cones. You may have heard that. Um, so Don and I are here representing Backstop 76. Um, it's, it's, um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a brief history of, of the work that we've done in democracy, human rights, and governance. So that's the DRG, you'll hear me say that, part of the backstop. Um, and then also um, we've worked in, in crisis stabilization, which Don will, will talk about that work. Um, although USAID was engaged to some 
you know, in some limited political development in our assistance in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I hope you're on slide two, by the way, Move, moving on to slide two. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, we're moving on. Um, the main origins of our current work um, started um, or, you know, democracy work started in the 80s as part of uh, President Reagan's emphasis on democracy promotion um, in countering the Soviet Union. Um, that administration and Congress encouraged the establishment of public diplomacy um, and foreign assistance initiatives that related specifically to spreading democracy, to supporting democracy. Um, at USAID, that, that push um, established in the Bureau for Latin America and, and the Caribbean a dedicated democracy assistance unit. And by 1989, the office had spent close to $100 million on democracy programs, primarily focused on human rights and democratic participation and the rule of law, reform, and, and then elections. Um, that forward movement on democracy at USAID accelerated during the Clinton years. Democracy and governance became one of the four core technical pillars of USAID. And at that time, the Democracy and Governance Center was created as was the Office of Transition Initiatives. Um, USAID spending on democracy and governance programs ballooned over these years from $165 million in 1991 to $635 million by 1999. And then today we're at $2.4 billion um, in democracy rights and governance, which is now a directive, meaning we have to spend that between USAID and state. And 1.6 billion of that is programmed by USAID in more than 80 countries globally. Um, so next slide. Um, so DRG has been, you know, is now truly a priority, um, a foundational importance of de the, for democracy, for global development and economic progress and thus for global st stability. It's clearer than ever that increasing awareness um, across the foreign policy community that democratic governments make better partners. Um, in recognition of this, our national security strategy focuses on national security efforts on strengthening democracy around the world in recognition of the fact that democratic governance consistently outperforms authoritarian governments. Um, in protecting human dignity, it leads to more prosperous and resilient societies and creates stronger and more reliable economic and security partners for the United States. Um, and of paramount importance for these democratic values, to, it's, of, it's of paramount importance for these democratic values to be more clear and uh, around democracy and the rule of law. And, and we are facing unprecedented challenges um, both um, at, at the country level on our, you know, at our country and globally. Um, so in order to address these challenges and bolster public faith in, in democracy and the rule of law, um, our joint USAID state strategic plan focuses on foreign assistance and public diplomacy programs, demonstrating how democratic governance tangibly leads to improvements in citizens' lives, including through including through efforts to reinforce judicial and legislative oversight and to improve access to justice. So we've moved on to the next slide. Um, so we now have a Democracy Rights and Governance Bureau um, that, that is brand new. It was actually officially launched today. Um, and um, so this is a very auspicious time for us. Um, and you'll see these are, you know, sort of our, our these are our state, this is our stated vision, mission, strategy. Um, our vision is a world where freedom is flourishing and democracy delivers for all. Um, our mission, we're, we're shaping policy and development agendas, generating knowledge and evidence that drives innovation and catalyzes partnerships and coalitions and mobilize cutting edge programs and technical assistance to enable USAID's missions and partners to accelerate uh, democratic uh, development globally. Um, so, and you can see on our website, you know, more details about our, uh, about our strategy. Um, the backstop 76, so the role of the foreign service officer 
um, in our missions, working around the this this mission, this vision, the strategy, includes, as you can see here, a whole host of areas that we that we focus on. Um, so you see, it's sort of a potpourri of issues under democracy, human rights, and governance, including democratic governance work with the media, obviously working on, on elections. That's often what we're known for, um, promoting justice and rule of law, human rights, um, and addressing and fighting corruption has now become a very critical area that we've been working, that, that we're, that we're working in. Um, it's, it's been elevated into its own center within our bureau, um, and, and promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in our work. Um, ensuring that all are included and represented in, in the governance process, including protecting the most vulnerable and focusing on barriers to women's participation in government and preventing and responding to gender-based violence. Um, so you'll see our, our priorities today um, relate to these emerging challenges in global democracy. We you may be aware that the president had has, has now had two summits for democracy with a host of democratic allies um, uh, talking about how we can all have more resilient democracies and strengthen our democracy. Um, and, and this is part of what we call doing democracy differently, that we are noting that we are among many nations that are struggling um, with our with our democratic systems and we're working in partnership um, to address those systems. Um, and and then you again you may have heard our administrator talking very often about the, the idea that we are looking to achieve progress beyond programs. Um, so much of our work is divided up into these projects where we you know go out in our missions, in the in the in the places where we work, and we um, you know have you know development programs, um, but it has to add up to some tangible progress um, in you know moving moving the dial, moving the needle in these countries in terms of their approach, you know, in terms of their democracy, in terms of their good governance practices. Um, and in terms of their their human rights practices. So I just want to quickly answer that question about what makes me passionate about this work. Um, honestly, I would say that that ev every day what I think about is how we can do this work better in partnership with youth. Um, in partnership with youth in all the countries that we work in, that is what I am deeply passionate about. Um, in the places where we work, in many of them, 70% of the population are considered youth. Um, and so we need to address, not only address their needs, but very clearly work in strong partnership with them um, so that they feel that, that our work um, is just in step with what they see as their vision for their future. Um, and so I will stop there and move on to Don. Don, please. Thanks, Tally. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. So much as Tally mentioned that the DRG um, Bureau was stood up today, we are also on a, a trajectory of having uh, greater importance within USAID. Um, we are the Conflict Prevention and Stabilization Bureau. And it used to be that, you know, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, when you thought of conflict, you thought of Afghanistan, you thought of Iraq, um, countries like that, that actually had ongoing um, kinetic wars. Um, but now, unfortunately, the world is changing and um, there's greater polarization, there's greater levels of violence, uh, more backsliding and something um, that we've seen the othering of different segments of society by other segments of society. And, and what, what that means now is that 80 percent of our missions uh, and offices outside the, the, the country work in places of conflict and fragility and violence where they're um, where they're endemic 
and it really affects our programming. And our programming is um, also has the ability to, to affect that dynamic as well. Um, unfortunately, our op, our bureau is in high demand. Um, and, and what it means is that we deal with partners and beneficiaries who've been victims of crime and violence. And it's really, it's difficult work. Um, but we're also, um, we're also exposed to, we have the opportunity to work with peace builders, remarkable champions for peace in, in the countries in which we work, who are doing the impossible and trying to stitch together networks, uh, trying to build social cohesion and, and really resurrect broken communities. And so as dire as things may seem at times, we see the best of, of humanity in the work that we do. Next slide, please. So these are the subsectors that we work in. You may recognize some of these names. Um, and just a few notes about these. These are all really exciting areas where we have growing list of uh, ways to help our partners work on these issues. Uh, these issues exist uh, all over the world. Uh, some may be more concentrated in um, some regions than others, but uh, there's there's programs uh, along these um, lines throughout the world. And we're involved in really every aspect of working on these issues from strategic planning to talking to stakeholders and beneficiaries and trying to design what the program would look like to the actual implementation of the program, working with our, our partners, whether they're local organizations or international organizations, and then also the, the monitoring and evaluation of the work. We're always trying to understand and learn what works and doesn't work. And so all of those aspects of uh, what we call the program cycle, we work on in all of these areas. It's really exciting, um, exciting subsectors uh, for us in which to work. Next slide, please. Back to you, Tally. Sorry about that. Yes. So um, when you're, you know, considering the possibility of coming into USAID as a backstop 76, um, the, you know, relevant coursework that you would do would include, you know, these kinds of things like conflict resolution, human rights, uh, social behavioral sciences, um, um, obviously government, public administration and management, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, relevant experience, um, we're looking for people that, you know, have an, an interest in, maybe have done internships related to democracy, human rights, governance, um, or, or, or conflict, conflict mitigation. Um, next slide. And, you know, we we kind of pulled and talked to some folks about the, the lessons they've learned along the way as DRG and or, you know, conflict officers, which very often were both in the same location. Um, and they talked about that um, a lot of our work isn't about the academics that just prepare that that's just the very early preparation. Um, and and it's it's really about learning as as you go and and you know this is very much an on the job training kind of kind of career. Um, we also are very aware that everything that we do has you know democracy, human rights, governance, and conflict elements. Um, so regardless of what backstop somebody is in, they have to be thinking about these issues. Um, depending on, you know, the administration, sometimes that these issues are, um, at the forefront of our policy and sometimes they're in the background. Um, but we know that for development work, um, they're always critically important. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I would also say that it's, it's just really also important to understand power dynamics incentives, disincentives, and how actors are acting in their context. We talk about 
um, uh, thinking and working politically. And, and, and um, that's very much an element of being um, a DRG officer, uh, con you know, a conflict, doing conflict mitigation, conflict stabilization, and the whole, and the whole backstop. So I will stop there. I believe that is our last slide. Am I right? Yep. Okay. So moving on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tally and uh, Don, for sharing with us. Gosh, it's so important. Um, you know, it 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 really uh, it keeps us on our toes when we look at exactly what's happening in the world today and how much so much of this is connected. Uh, so your work is so very much important. Um, Kevin, we're going to turn it over to you now um, for the humanitarian backstop presentation. Thank you so Don't much. Don't forget to share your passion too. What keeps I, you I going? Will. I, will, I will do that. <laughs> we didn't Thank hear you so from much. Don. Don, we didn't hear from you. <laughs> uh oh, Don, you want to go first, and then I can start. Sure. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I've been thinking about this. I uh, take, I'm ripping off the last slide. Uh, puzzles. I like puzzles. And what I mean by that is the opportunity as a DRG officer to really um, to learn, learning from partners, learning from beneficiaries, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And everything is a puzzle. And, uh, you know, I like to find the good. I like to see the opportunities to, to, to help folks make their communities a little bit better. And I just appreciate the constant, um, the constant need to kind of figure this puzzle out of the work that we have to do every day. Thank you, Don. Uh, we'll try to help you figure out the puzzle too. <laughs> Over to you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, and good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here um, and present for uh, BHA, uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and the new Backstop uh, 70. Um, I will say that I am not a Backstop 70. I'm actually a Backstop 02, a program officer, but I have been blessed and allowed by BHA to come over um, and infiltrate uh, their side and, and work with them. It's been um, an awesome experience. Um, and it kind of just gets to that question you asked um, about what is the passion. And I guess, you know, just to keep it short, is just to, to be an op have an opportunity to be of service. Um, and I've really seen that as being in BHA um, and doing a lot of the humanitarian assistance work that we've done and responding to emergencies quickly. Um, and so, I will get into that. Um, Melina, I don't know if you have the presentation ready. Thank you. Um, and we could just go actually into the next slide. So what is BHA? Um, as an overview, USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, or again, BHA, is lead coordinator of US assistance, excuse me, US international disaster assistance, reaching tens of millions of people around the world. In 2020, BHA was separated from the Democracy Conflict Humanitarian Assistance Bureau, which you heard about that bureau in the previous presentation, and a new bureau was created by merging the expertise and resources of the offices of Food for Peace and Foreign Disaster Assistance. The combination of these two offices gave USAID a stronger, more robust, and influ influential voice on humanitarian assistance. Now, the frequency and scale and complexity of crises have significantly increased over the past decade. And as humanitarian emergencies evolve, so must we, USAID, and the world. We are the only USAID Bureau that works toward a more comprehensive approach to humanitarian responses. We do this by providing critical humanitarian aid to people in need, while also setting the initial foundations for longer-term recovery where appropriate. Now, BHA also invests in disaster risk reduction programs. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, and those programs prevent, reduce, and manage risks associated with chronic and recurrent hazards, such as hurricanes or flooding, and thereby contributing to the achievement of sustainable development. Our mission is very straightforward. We're here to save lives, alleviate human suffering, and reduce the physical, social, and economic impact of humanitarian crisis. We work to provide those life-saving humanitarian, provide life-saving humanitarian aid, and also to help the world's most vulnerable people prepare, recover, and transition from crisis toward resilience. That is our ultimate goal. Next slide. Now, what do we do? Um, again, as I said, what our mission was, what it, our mission is, BHA's life-saving work can broadly be broken down into four core areas. 
response, early recovery, risk reduction, and resilience. Next slide. Now this picture gives um, a vision of where we are. So to accomplish our mission, BHA has hundreds of humanitarian and development experts located in our Washington DC headquarters, which you can kind of see in a star um, where you see that DC area. Um, we have six regional offices, uh, one in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, Budapest, Hungary, Dakar, Senegal, Pretoria, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, and Bangkok, Thailand. And 43, we work in 43 countries around the world. And this includes experts in food security, nutrition, water, health, shelter, logistics, agriculture, and protection. We also have humanitarian advisors at the USUN missions around the world and at the CDC in Atlanta to help coordinate our responses as well as broad as a broader policy and reform issues and work on broader policy and reform issues. We have humanitarian advisors at the combatant commands to help advise the US military and to build our relationships with the Department of Defense counterparts. And finally, we have relief supplies pre-positioned in five warehouses globally in Miami, Houston, South Africa, United Arab Emirates, and Djibouti. And these uh, warehouses are stocked with foods and other critical relief supplies that can be transported rapidly around the world. Next slide. Now, BHA cannot do this work alone. We tap into a bigger network and work together to respond to disasters. Some of the groups that we work with include the communities and governments of the affected countries, international and local partners, other US government agencies and departments, international donor community, the private sector, and many more. Next slide. Responding to our dis to disasters take up a good portion of our time and resources. Just in fiscal year 2022, we responded to 74 crises in 64 countries. This included responding to natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, and storms, complex emergencies involving conflict, and food emergencies worldwide. So specific responses that we that we worked on this year or last year, excuse me, were the war in Ukraine, flooding in Pakistan, South Africa, Honduras, Bangladesh, and Chad historic drought in Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya, or the Horn of Africa, cyclones in Madagascar, Mozambique, a hurricane in the Dominican Republic, a super typhoon in the Philippines, food insecurity in Guatemala, Honduras, Mauritania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, volcanic eruptions, uh, specifically in Tonga, and complex emergencies in countries such as Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, Venezuela, and the Central African Republic. In terms of dollars, we provided more than 11.8 billion to help people affected by disasters and conflict, deliver emergency food assistance to refugees and give communities the tools that they need to be resilient to future crises. One of our most funded types of assistance was food assistance. And we respond to disasters involving conflict or complex emergencies more than any other type of disaster. Next slide. So all of this brings us to the backstop 70, which is the humanitarian assistance officer. What is an HAO? Next slide, please. As the most recent technical backstop, the creation of the humanitarian assistance officer or backstop 70 in 2021 was a major milestone for the agency. This backstop recognized the growing importance of humanitarian assistance in USAID and ensured that the agency had and remains, continues to have the expertise to respond to the increased and unprecedented global needs created by the confluence of COVID-19, climate change and climate related disasters and conflict. HAOs support USAID's efforts to address the many complex and multifaceted humanitarian emergencies through disaster risk reduction, early recovery and resilience activities that help communities prepare for and recover from disasters. Additionally, they work to strengthen linkages and USAID missions between our development and humanitarian programming. Next slide. Now, how can you prepare to become an HAO? There are many ways to prepare for working as an HAO, including but not limited to graduate degrees that focus on humanitarian assistance, humanitarian action, international policy, international development, governance, um, coursework, 
in various areas. And as you can see here, there's a long list, um, but I'll just name a few. Uh, environmental and urban studies or monitoring evaluation, um, human rights and protection, conflict crisis management, global health, gender or youth studies, community development, or on the job opportunities with uh, various humanitarian organizations. And this could be through internships, uh, fellowships or work study programs. Uh, next slide. And now um, I'd actually like to introduce, we have two of uh, BHA's newest HAOs with us, Katrina Mahoney, as she was introduced earlier, a former Payne Fellow and current care career candidate core FSO who's working in Washington, and Brett Burkhart, an FSO working in the field who's just successfully completed the career candidate core program and will be uh, moving to his next post. Both will share some insight on their experiences as new officers in the new backstop and give you a glimpse uh, into their day to day. So I would like to just pass the mic over to Katrina to start us off and then we will move to Brett. Over to you, Katrina. Awesome, thanks so much, Kevin. And, and uh, thank you to the Payne Fellowship for hosting this webinar. Thanks to all of you in the audience. Uh, for joining us. My name is Katrina Mahoney. As mentioned, I'm a 2020 Payne alum, very proud alum, and as of last June, a humanitarian assistance foreign service officer. Um, so I've been with the agency for a little over a year. Um, I'll be very brief here, just we'll talk about my educational professional career, uh, and then transition to my current role within BHA. Um, so a little bit about my background. I grew up uh, in the suburbs of Maryland, I'm based in DC currently. And then I later moved to inner city Boston where my mother's from. And so I started to get involved in community service because it was a way for me to you know, really learn about the city. Uh, and through that, I you know, learned about different cultures and immigrant groups and social issues that plague uh, really any city, right? And so uh, I then decided to study sociology and anthropology. I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, historically Black College, to learn more about these topics that I got in, into in, when I moved to Boston. Um, and so during my time there, I was very fortunate to receive the Gilman Scholarship to study abroad. So I went to Morocco, shout out to, I think it's Kyle in the audience who's, um, who's based there now. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, I went there for a semester and, you know, little did I know really that that experience would you know, lead me to where I am now. Um, so in Morocco, I studied migration and transnational identity, um, and I explored these similar themes of migration, of food insecurity, and just overall instability, right, uh, that I was exposed to when I, when I moved to Boston. Um, so I decided to return to Morocco as a Fulbright researcher to further that um, exploration. And Honestly, at that time, I was on track to pursue a PhD, um, but I decided to follow a more practitioner track and really work on these issues and try to, to see positive outcomes um, for, in particular, refugees and immigrants and people on the move um, from, from West Africa. So I later worked a bit uh, in Geneva with the UN. That's actually where I first learned about USAID and the Pain Fellowship, um, and then I moved back to DC uh, where I transitioned more to the humanitarian sector and I worked at an NGO um, called Interaction doing some protection work there. Uh, and then in 2019, I applied to the Payne Fellowship and was very, very fortunate to receive it. Um, this was at the height of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so like Zach uh, on, the, on the panel here, we came in together and unfortunately we didn't have the opportunity to take advantage of the full suite or the full package um, of benefits that the fellowship offers, uh, such as the congressional internship and the overseas placement um, at a USAID mission. But I did have the privilege of working remotely with uh, USAID Mission Sri Lanka. I also attended um, Georgetown School of Foreign Service, and I also had a host of mentors um, that guided me along the way. And fun fact, Kevin here on the call is my um, my supervisor. He's he's great. Uh, so uh, fast forward to today, I've been working um, at BHA again for nearly a year and a half, and I've been in training period. Um, what does that mean? I created, or excuse me, I completed a series of rotations um, within the bureau to really understand our mandate and practice and establish meaningful relationships uh, with my colleagues. So. Uh, I was assigned to 
Ethiopia, the Ethiopia mission earlier this year. So I've been preparing for that. I've had the opportunity in my year here to um, visit our warehouses in Houston and Miami, where we store um, both our food commodities, such as wheat, um, and our non-food items, such as hygiene kits or water bladders. Um, and what else? I've conducted research on how BHA can uh, so-called green its supply chain um, or how we can uh, really promote circular uh, economies uh, with, with the waste that we produce. When we when we deliver uh, in kind commodities and, and NFIs, non food items, um, I also worked in our technical shop uh, where Kevin is 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 placed and um, offered some recommendations on how we can better integrate these different technical sectors uh, to promote uh, disaster risk reduction and management outcomes. Um, and then more recently, I worked on the Northern Ethiopia response. Um, which was stood up uh, back in 2021, actually. This was a complex emergency still ongoing in response to the conflict in the north of the country in Tigray, and then transitioned to uh, the Ethiopia home team or the steady state team, um, where I assisted with managing our awards um, with our partners there. So it's been a really incredible time with BHA. I've also completed a series of trainings as mentioned earlier, it's it's less about what you learn before you come in and, and what you're willing to learn um, once you're here. Uh, I'll also add that I'm part of an affinity group and other groups within the agency. And so overall, it's just a wonderful, truly wonderful um, culture and community of really brilliant and um, mission-minded driven people. Um, as you could see, my, my journey was truly uh, anything but linear, very circuitous. Um, but I would really encourage folks to seek opportunities overseas, as, as Kevin mentioned, um, you know, consider the Peace Corps, um, consider working with an implementing partner, consider internships at USAID, and to answer the, the prompt, Eureka, of what, you know, what's that passion that keeps me going? I would say that I consider myself to be a highly sensitive person, and, um, you know, there's inherent trade-offs with that, but I, I do feel like it's my duty uh, to serve, it's my duty to contribute um, positively to, to really all the suffering that's that's going on in the world. Over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Katrina. And as you guys see, she is a rising star and has taken full advantage of the time that she's had in Washington, which is awesome. Um, before we pass it to Brett, I want to quickly pass it to Zach Worley, who's also a former Payne Fellow, um, as uh, Eureka and Katrina mentioned earlier, um, to talk a little bit about his experience on the Backstop 76 side. Um, and then we'll transition back to Brett. Over to you, Zach. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Um, as uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, my name is Zach Worley. I'm a 2022 Pain Fellow with Katrina, and I came in as a Crisis Stabilization and Governance Officer. Um, my path... Um, to USAID was also um, was also circuitous, but I came really became really interested in this link between um, between initially food security and conflict, um, and then the broader question of of what international development means and can do for U.S. national security as a whole, and how we can be effective development advocates and pursue a development mandate um, while also making sure our voices are heard um, in in traditional national security discussions and conversations. And it's been really exciting to sort of see that work um, um, happened firsthand during my first my first year at USAID. Um, I was placed into our um, uh, democracy, human rights, and governance. Uh, what was in the center is now a bureau working on our evidence and learning team um, to help shape the way that we um, program our money um, and making sure that we're doing it in ways that's that are effective and that are impactful um, and that can make a difference. Um, and I got to work on a variety of really interesting issues. I helped draft our 10-year strategy um, for um, uh, conflict and fr fragility prevention um, as part of the Global Fragility Act and the strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability in coastal West Africa. Um, I helped um, with our Sudan response during my um, time in the Africa Bureau, um, working with the conflict, conflict Peace Building and Governance Division. Um, overall, it's just been a really um, awesome way to, to engage on issues that matter. And I think to answer 
um, to answer the question of the evening, um, it's really rare, I've found, even in Washington, to be um, someone who gets to say, you know, I go to work every day to work, as Katrina said, to, to contribute, to give back and to make a difference. Um, and we get to do that um, for some of the for some of the biggest issues facing the world. It's been a really unique opportunity. Um, and I would highly, highly encourage you to um, to pursue it. Um, I will leave it at that. Thanks for that, Zach. Um, and just over to you, Brett. All right. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks to the panel. And everyone who's joined today. I think, um, yeah, no, this is, it's a unique opportunity to talk about where we come from. And I think, you know, like, like Katrina mentioned, and probably many of you guys, I, I grew up with in a family that was very focused on, on service. Um, and for me, I graduated from undergraduate with my undergraduate degree and wanted to be a teacher and found that I could get my teaching credential as a Peace Corps volunteer. So I did Peace Corps in Mongolia for two years. And I had experiences in Mongolia that actually made me think I'd be more effective working in, in the international sphere and development in particular, as opposed to being a teacher. So I kind of continued with that. Um, I got a master's degree um, in international development from the Institute for Development Studies in, in Brighton in the UK. And I was able to focus on disaster risk reduction, which was kind of a uh, not a very big topic at the time, um, but it was super interesting. And then I, yeah, I was applying for jobs in a really rough market. And the one job that called me back was USAID for Afghanistan. And I was, I was in a, I, I basically lived on a Marine base in Southern Helmand, which was a really uh, kinetic area at the time. Um, but it was great because I was on the ground. I got to work with farmers and see what their reality was. And I got to use some of my, you know, the things that I learned in my, in my master's degree and then later, I, I wound up moving to Kabul and working at the mission for a couple of years and got to really see what a USAID mission was like and all of the assistance that we provide, especially uh, in the space of Afghanistan in that 2012, 2014 timeframe. It was, it was massive. Um, and then when I finished in Afghanistan, I, I took a position with what was the, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. It's now merged as part of BHA. Um, and that was... You know, it was a that was a really great experience for me. I, I first really started working on the response side of things, and I was a couple of months in, and they needed folks to go to the uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak. So I went to Liberia um, on the on the disaster assistance response team to make programs um, to benefit the folks who were su who were suffering from Ebola, and and um, Soon after that, I was called to work on the on the DC side for the for the Nepal earthquake earthquake in 2015. I worked on um, Hurricane Matthew in Haiti, the Venezuela response, and then I was in Haiti again earlier this year for their more complex emergency um, with kind of yeah descending into gang violence. Um, all of which are have been super amazing experiences and and. And really, I think the reason why I continue doing this work, I think what I'll echo what Zach and Katrina have said so far about, you know, this being a really meaningful work. And, you know, I think I think government work can always have its um, it's it's <laughs> people people will, will say what they will about government work. And, and yeah, there's times where it's not always the, the sexiest thing in the world. But there are times where, especially in this line of work, we really get to make um huge, huge strides on things. And I'll even say working here at the, I'm, I'm currently in El Salvador. Um, and I'll say that with, uh, with the, with the other backstops that, that have presented today with the democracy rights and governance and the um, CSP, sorry, I, I still think it's OTI. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, like everyone here is working on really amazing things. So I came um, after I joined the foreign service in 2021 um, and came to El Salvador uh, about a year ago and work on our portfolio here is really amazing. Um, we, we, we're addressing on the response side of things, we're working on food security and protection. Um, and then and then on the disaster risk reduction side, we're working with the, the National Disaster Response Agency, which is Protection Civil in the in centralized areas or in, in San Salvador um, on you know, urban search and rescue and training, training text, technical experts. Um, and um, and then in the field, we also work with communities to prepare them for disasters as well. So working with communities to do participatory processes to identify where there are risks and how they can um, go about um, 
addressing those with what the community has. Sometimes we do add other resources, but um, I will say since I've been here, my day to day is so interesting. I never know what's going to happen <laughs> tomorrow. Um, I just get thrown into things. I might be, you know, in the field working with, uh, you know, one of our partners, Catholic Relief Services, who is working on climate smart agriculture. So we're looking at building organic matter in the soil so that the corn that's grown is more sustainable, more drought resistant um, and doing integrated pest management. And the next day I might be speaking at, you know, to last week I was speaking to um, uh, engineers and architects who are trained um, in uh, assessing damaged buildings following earthquakes. Um, and um, what else? Recently, you know, because as I, I mentioned, I, I kind of focused on disaster risk reduction. I recently, the uh, the Protection Civil, the National Disaster Response Agency, decided that they were going to release their national, or before they released it, they told us about their national disaster risk reduction plan. And so had us look at it and evaluate and provide feedback to them. So I think, you know, that's a huge step in, in terms of, you know, saving lives um, for future for future uh, disasters. Obviously, with with climate change being in the mix, I think this is hugely important. And uh, while it's while it's a policy, it's not always to me. I it's not why I got into this, but I do feel like it's an opportunity to make a huge impact. Um, so yeah, I think I think I can say definitely my my day to day is is super interesting. Um, and I think that you know. Uh, should you have interest in, in any of these areas of USAID, all of them have amazingly unique opportunities that I, no one prepared me for this when I was in high school or college. No one told me that this was an option. And I think, you know, you all definitely have um, a unique opportunity to, to going forward um, with this fellowship to, to jump on some really awesome and unique opportunities. And I'd hope to see you guys around around USA at some point. Over. Thanks for that, Brett. Um, and over to you, Eureka. Um, that's it for Batch Lab 70. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, listen, you all are so inspiring. And the thing is that is when you see the disasters hit across the world and the conflicts come in, it's a good thing that you also see USAID is in the forefront of providing support and assistance. And it's thanks to the work that you all are doing. So we thank you very much. And Zach and Katrina, we are so proud of you. We can't stop talking about you all. And of course, one of our pain, Brianna is also on, wave your hand. She's a 2022 pain fellow. Um, she'll be onboarding very soon. But anyway, I wanna open it up for, uh, for questions from our participants. Either raise your hand and present your question, or if you wanna put it in the chat, this is your opportunity to ask these questions, uh, to learn more about these backs up and the amazing work that they are doing across the world. And thank you all for your service. So who's gonna, who's got the first question? Nobody? I get you guys rock, <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Talia, for sharing um, some more information in the chat. Let's see, anyone? Did we scare you or okay, Jazz, Jasm, please, uh, if you could, um, you know, come off camera and please ask your question, followed by Kyle. Um, hi, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. I really enjoyed um, learning about both the crisis and the humanitarian um, backstops. I was curious, um, what has been the the most challenging aspect of being a humanitarian backstop officer versus being a crisis and stabilization officer? Kevin, anyone on your team? Okay. Well, I mean, again, I'm not an HA officer yet. I'm still a program officer, so I can't answer that one, but I can pass it to Brett. I can also pass it to Mike, um, two HA officers who've been with BHA um, in when they were off there and when we were food for peace. So um Brett or Mike. I can I can I can go. I think uh I'll say I'll 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 point at my um uh, my experience on the uh West Africa Ebola Dart. I had only been with with um uh BHA at the time for only a couple of months and you know I was learning our programming on the fly. Um you know we're working you know 12 to 14 hours a day um it's it's really intense 
Um, but I think, you know, and, and there could be, it can be some of the best and the worst. I think what I really love about those experiences is that's when I truly get to know my colleagues. And I think that when you find in the humanitarian assistance, when you have that time with people and, and it goes beyond the nine to five, you really start to see who they are and how they are and, and, and kind of really create lasting bonds. Some of my best friends, you know, before my time with, with BHA in Afghanistan, I still have lifelong friends from those kind of more hardship type experiences. And I also think that, you know, really seeing the, 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 you know, being able to, um, address a disaster head on and, and um, benefit people who need it most working with the most vulnerable people. Um, those are the, the great rewards. So it, I, it's not to say that it's all easy all the time. It can be extremely challenging, but I think sometimes I find the most challenging parts also at the same time, the most rewarding parts. Over. Anyone else want to do them? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Kevin. No, I'm just going to turn to Mike to see if he had any. Sure, I really, I really liked what Brett said about the best and the worst. Um, Kevin, I'm with you. I, I am actually not backstop seventy um, either, though I've done the humanitarian assistance work for more than a decade. Interestingly, I was backstop seventy six during all that time because this was before BHA and before the new backstop, and I think for both. 76 and 70. To Brett's point, there are times when the work that you're doing is so compelling and so mission driven and so impactful that it's it's inspirational and, and motivating. But at the same time, to the point on challenge, um, we have limits um, on how far and how fast and how hard we can go. And we also have limits as USAID on the outcomes we can really expect. So manage it, taking care of yourself and taking care of your, your teammates um, in either backstop, given the contexts in the challenge in which we work and the challenges we have, I think is is tough and really important to be able to manage to manage well. Thank you, Mike. Um, Tanya, did you want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Um, let's go on to um, Kyle. You have a question. And tell us Hi. what you're to. Uh -huh. Much. Um, kind of open to everyone. Um, Talked about like, rough. Uh, you're breaking up a bit, Kyle. Uh, I'm so sorry. We're in a windstorm a bit. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, but your there was recommended coursework and presentation talked about like recommended experiences. But I'm wondering if we could talk about like maybe one big idea that they think really help them in their work. You're still, the you're still breaking up pretty bad, Kyle. T turn your camera off and just go ahead. You might be able to come through a little clearer. Go ahead. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, anyone had like a specific class they really connected with other like general coursework or like a specific learning opportunity that they had beforehand that like connected a lot with their current work. Did y'all get that? Um, you know, how did your work prior to um, the USA, your USAID work in your backstep, how did that connect and assist you? If anyone wants to take a stab at that. Well, I, I will, although it's many, many years ago, I, I, <laughs> graduated from the from the school of internet of uh, the, uh from SCAR um school of conflict analysis and conflict resolution at George Mason University many many years ago um but i will say that i um took some courses there that were very um app uh, practical 
um, where we actually did analysis of specific conflicts and thought about and, and wrote essentially mock proposals on how to address those conflicts through, um, through assistance. Um, and um, and really thought through, you know, beyond the academic, what information we needed to know in order to on the ground address address the 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 issues. It it actually kind of goes to the question that I think that was asked about whether you know we only work in in war zones versus you know just in in you know with with marginalized populations. Um, and I would say that that a lot of our work is 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 not necessarily in war zones. In fact, often you know we get you know there there are we 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 have to depart when we're really in the midst of a, of, of a war. Um, but um, but we are day to day working within communities to do conflict prevention, conflict mitigation, and frankly, a lot of that looks like traditional democracy promotion, human rights work, and good governance work, because a lot of that conflict is around corruption. It's around elections and power dynamics. Um, it's it's around um, human rights abuses of uh, marginalized populations. Um, so, these, so these things are very connected. And um, I would say that if you have the opportunity to do a practicum while you're doing your academic training, um, that will serve you very well. Thank you, Tally. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Uh, Rose, you have your hands up. Hi, um, I was just wondering, is it still com common to have like people go straight from undergrad to pain or like would you recommend it something more like um, to wait a little bit longer? I was just wondering like, uh, the is it like I know the example some of the people Allah had a very varied experiences but I was just wondering if you recommend people wait more or or is it possible to go more direct from undergrad thank you Kevin do you all want to take that I know we for the pain fellowship we get a variety of um, uh, applicants and fellows some have some experience others have come directly from undergrad because they have this passion and they're burning and they want to serve so it's a combination of two but you know um, colleagues if you want to share your perspective that would be helpful and also Zach and um, yeah Trina. I, maybe I would just quickly say that um, you can totally come straight out of undergrad I think it's important to recognize and this goes to the the points about classwork and the congressional internship and the internship you get to do um, with USAID, we we come in and we're working with people like Brett, who had an entire career doing exactly this work before he started as a foreign service officer. And we come in, um, some with more experience, some with less, but I think across the board with considerably less practical experience, we haven't built up sometimes those professional skills, sometimes um, pain uh, fellows have never you know, worked for the federal government for before. They don't know people that work for the federal government. So um, making sure to fill the gaps in your own personal, professional, and academic experience, I think is really important to set yourself up for success, to really hit the ground running once you get to USAID and do the things that Tali talked about, which is really like learning on the job once you get here. Um, but I think, um, especially if you're coming straight out of undergrad, taking classes in writing, in management, in leadership, in negotiations. Um, these are skills that people learn over the course of their entire career. Um, and it's good to it's good to sort of get the jump on some of those um, when you can in your um, in your graduate program. Good point, Thank Zach. You. And um, we do provide some professional training for the pain fellows and you are assigned to a mentor, um, a USAID mentor in particularly in your backstop. So over the two years, they can sort of like guide you through. Uh, and then you do have a 10 week um, summer placement at a USAID mission in the backstop that you're uh, aspiring to. So you get that kind of experience. But I think what Zach mentioned there is, is perfect. The additional kinds of experience that you want to get uh, under your belt if you're coming directly from undergrad. Um, if anybody else has anything to, to add, and if not, um, I'll pass it on to Imhotep and then we may have uh, time for maybe one more question. I don't want to hold up my colleagues. <laughs> it's been a long day for them too, but Imhotep, please go ahead. 
Hey, greetings to you all. And uh, thank you so much for your insight thus far. Please bear with me. I'm on the road. So if you hear GPS kind of background echo, please bear with me. Um, so I guess my inquiry is kind of associated with the conflict that's currently occurring between Israel and like the Gaza Strip. Um, I think like in like international development occasionally, um, you know, as it pertains to U.S. foreign policy, um, I think we typically side with like uh, David when thinking about like the David and Goliath antidote. Um, but obviously, like earlier today or so, I think Joe Biden and administ Administrator Powell kind of announced $100 million in like humanitarian foreign assistance being awarded to Israel, if I like read the headline correctly. Um, but obviously, I guess in this context, um, like the Gaza Strip would be kind of the David, also with the nuance and context that Hamas is like. Uh, you know, categorized as a terrorist group, which we don't as, like negotiate with. And obviously, you know, they would be an antagonist in this context. So I guess aware of like the external facing stance of the US, USA, um, but wondering what's the sentiment like in kind of some of those conversations uh, within the foreign service amongst officers and the context with, within thinking about that kind of David and the and Goliath kind of antidote and typically siding with smaller uh, entities, marginalized groups and things of that sort. So what value anyone's insight on that? Thank you. Um, Mike? Tough question. Um, I, I wouldn't put it in David and Goliath terms, but I would say the current situation in Israel and uh, Gaza um, has been extremely complex and challenging for a number of reasons. You, you heard uh, President Biden um, state very clearly uh, the U.S. support uh, for in Israel to defend itself initially, um, and that's a continued talking point, but you're also hearing him and other representatives of the U.S. government start to talk importantly about um, the protection of the civilian population within Gaza, humanitarian principles, um, and just really looking at both sides of the equation. And I think it's a good illustration um, of the work that USAID does in both of these backstops as part of a whole of government effort. It does have to take into a number of different considerations, but but very clearly, and I think you'll see it more and more, that both sides of that equation in terms of standing with Israel from a diplomatic posture, um, fight against terrorism is one principle, but then the protection of the civilian population, humanitarian principles um, being maintained, international humanitarian law uh, within Gaza is the other part of that. So this is gonna be um, a, a challenging context, but it's really at the heart of, of how we work together within the US government, not just USAID, not just the State Department, not just the Department of Defense, but as a whole of government, um, one team approach, not easy, not always straightforward, but but that's that's what we've got going here, over. Thank you for your comments, Mike. Um, uh, Bruce, uh, I think you want to make a comment too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to jump in on this one because I remember when I first started with um, BHA, I was a recruiter for a spell, and there was a question that they used to ask folks, and it's something along the lines of, "What do you do uh, when you when you're faced with something, a policy, or you know, something of the the U.S. government that you personally?" disagree with and you know mm -hmm. I've come back to this question you know I I heard that question for the first time in 2008 and I've come back to that I come back to this question regularly and obviously I think this conflict at the forefront has that to it like from from the beginning right and um I think I had a conversation with a, a friend here in um, El Salvador who's a consular officer so he's 
taking visa or taking answering emails for people he's kind of put on the side to work specifically on this conflict for American citizens um, in Israel. Um, might be Gaza as well, but I think just Israel for now. Um, and, and he and I had a conversation about this. And I think it, and Mike mentioned it, is that, you know, in humanitarian assistance, there is, we are a part of USAID, um, obviously, but there is a humanitarian world that that is in the UN sphere. Um, and I think that the humanitarian principles that Mike uh, talked about are extremely important. And I, you know, like I say, I think about this kind of conflict of when you personally disagree with things. I haven't been faced in that situation to a point where I totally disagree, but I, I knew some colleagues during the 2010 Haiti earthquake who were kind of at this. And for some folks, it was kind of a, a, a point of pride um, that the ambassador kicked them out of country because they stood up to the ambassador and really felt passionately about that humanitarian principle. Obviously that's you know something that everyone kind of deals with on their own, but I do think it's an important thing. And and I think it's it's a very timely question, right? And you know, I I think for us it's 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 all difficult to answer until we know more. But I I do, you know, I do think that we 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 have to find a way for humanitarian access. I think that's that's first and foremost and that that has to be kind of the direction we take things in BHA as humanitarians and seeing things through that humanitarian lens. And that conversation I had with my buddy the other day, you know, like it doesn't matter where we think we might stand on one side of that conversation or another, but I can tell you humanity is losing today. And I think that's the important part. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Britt. Kevin. Uh, no, I saw somebody else had a question, so I didn't want to, um, oh, okay. time. All right. so it's okay. We can pass over to the next question. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your comments, Mike and, and Britt. Um, my brother sent me a, a text yesterday and um, he reminded me of a song my mom used to sing a lot. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> uh, and you know what? Um, that's what we need quite a lot of. So uh, Jalen is the next question. You have your hands up. Yes. Thank you so much for this session and for answering all of our questions. Um, for the last question, I was just wondering, so a few of you spoke about your trajectory being nonlinear, or I think the word you used was more circular. And for me specifically, like coming out of undergrad, I did Peace Corps and then worked a bit in international education. And I'd like to know what you would say specifically compelled you to pursue a career in diplomacy with USAID as opposed to the State Department. Um, go ahead, anyone in particular? Jalen? It's just in general. Okay. All righty. Kevin. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I missed that. I didn't quite hear that. Could you repeat that, Jalen? Yes. So I was wondering, um, people spoke about their career tra trajectory being nonlinear or circular. And I was wondering what compelled you to pursue a career specifically in diplomacy with USAID as opposed to State Department or something beyond those two entities. Okay, okay. So looking at development rather than diplomacy. Um, I would say for me, um, I was actually an undergrad um, at FAMU doing my MBA, getting my master's in business um, administration um, and did not want to do that, didn't know what to do. Um, and I studied abroad and I was always in the community doing community development um, in Tallahassee and Minneapolis and places where I um, lived study abroad in Ghana um, and did some community work there um, and had known about State Department, but really it wasn't pulling me. Um, and then one night while I was in Ghana, I had learned about USAID um, and started doing more and more research about what USAID does. Um, and as I said earlier, my passion was having the opportunity to be of service and learning more about USAID and the work that we really get into that pulled me. Um, and so I went back, I came back to the U.S., um, did my master's degrees um, and looked at USAID. Um, and so I think it was just the the mission of the agency um, for me um, was that pull. 
Yeah, I, I want to respond to this momentarily um, just because I had a really good point of comparison. My husband is a State Department Foreign mm -hmm. Service Officer. So for a number of years, I actually worked with an organization called Search for Common Ground, actually working <laughs> on the yeah. Arab-Israeli peace process when that was a thing, um, and, and ultimately decided because... I'd gotten a lot of, oh, well, why don't you just join the Foreign Service, you know, that a lot of spouses actually get, um, especially if they're working to anything adjacent to diplomacy. Um, and I really looked into it, and it was very clear to, for me, and this is just very personal, that I wanted to focus on doing things and being out in the communities that was the work that I wanted to, to really put my energy into. State Department officers tend more to be doing more analysis of the situation and thinking about policy based on that analysis. Whereas, you know, we're putting money into what we think will actually, you know, shift the needle on some mm -hmm. critical issue. Um, and, and it is much more community oriented. Um, and so for me, that was a, a very easy choice. Um, but we do see people start out at aid and go to state. And we see people start out at state and go to aid. And the key is that you all also work closely together at the US, at the US embassies. Oh, abs yes, absolutely. I mean, your interagency skills, as we call them, are absolutely critical to your success. Okay. Mike, Brett, do you want to add to that? I would just quickly uh, foot stomp what Tally said about the direct engagement with communities and, and really, you know, get getting your hands dirty and doing doing some of the work. Um, I had the opportunity right after Peace Corps to join USAID in the same country where I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I had gotten to know USAID from the vantage point of being in a community with no money. <laughs> I, I had no resources. I, um, I had ideas. And um, when I had the chance to to jump into a job with USAID, it was just a great opportunity to take all the skills that I had developed as a Peace Corps volunteer without a budget and, and start to put some resources to work. And it was it was it was a great transition for me. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah, I want to just quickly um, touch on a point that Tally mentioned in the end um, about that interagency skill set and more so around the soft skills. Um, as you know, many of you guys are coming in and looking at um, coursework and, you know, what kind of um, book knowledge, if you will, that you can that was to prepare you for this. Having those soft skills is just as if not more important. Um, understanding how to engage and work with others, understanding how to move and lead teams, understanding how to, yeah, emotional intelligence um, is very important. Your negotiation skills is very important. You can get a lot of things done. I like to tell folks you get more with honey, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Um, and so as you matriculate through your, your um, graduate degree, your graduate um, programs, and as you look to apply for Payne Fellow or even look to apply for um, the C3 program, find opportunities where you can strengthen your soft skills um, and continue to build that. You will need it before you get in, you'll need it while you're in, um, and we'll continue to build those up. So just wanted to, to highlight that. Thank you, Kevin. Excellent advice. And the last question for any one of you, um, how do you maintain your work-life balance? Anyone answer? <laughs> I think that's something that we all really, really struggle with in this career. Mm -hmm. um, when when you're when you're working at a mission, when you're at post at an you know at an embassy, um, you are considered to be on duty twenty four seven in the sense of, you know, you are always um, representing the United States of America. Um, and so um, now, of course, you have your life. I've raised two children in the foreign service. Um, you get to do amazing travel. You have, you still have to come home and, and, and make dinner and all of that. And, and I think there is an understanding of that. Um, but you know, this is, this is not just a career. It's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in Washington, work-life balance tends to be better. 
Um, but you know, the, 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 the fact is that if you're working on, you know, the travel of some really important person, um, or certainly when you're working in humanitarian assistance and there's a crisis, um, you know, the job at that point does take over your life. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way, but it, it, it may, again, that may not work. That might not work for some people. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is something to think about. All right, Tally, thank you so much. Um, before we do the final close, I want to ask my colleague, uh, Melina, I think you have a, a couple of quick announcements. Yes, absolutely. Thanks everyone for being here with us once again. And I just want to remind everyone that the application deadline is the 26th. I dropped some links in the chat and asking folks to please check out our upcoming events, as well as if you're interested in seeing archived events that we have, we have a series on YouTube up now. So please, you know, tune in and keep in touch. You can always reach us. I will drop the email uh, for where you can uh, reach us with your inquiries. We welcome them. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Melina. And listen, I just wanna thank all of our colleagues from USAID for spending their evening with us or, where, or whatever time it is where you are. Um, we appreciate you so much. And I know if we have questions, from the participants we'll pass them on to you if you need to connect with them directly if you want to put that in the chat please feel free to do so we thank you um and we look forward to having other discussions but again to all of you who are applying you've heard it from our colleagues um hopefully you'll be some of their future colleagues at usaid please make certain that you also go on to the usaid website to learn more about usaid's work around the world and especially in these two backstops. So everyone have a lovely evening. Everyone stay safe, stay well. See you all. Take care everyone. Hands up, big hearts. <laughs> Take care everybody. Keep well. <laughs>